I'm Rick Valerius with the Woodstock Groundhog Day Committee. People on this side, out of state. Anybody? Where are you from? Ohio. Ohio? Wisconsin? Wisconsin? Yeah. Over here? <laughs> Where? Wisconsin? Tennessee? Anybody up there? Wisconsin. Wisconsin? First time at the Groundhog Day in Woodstock? Thank you for coming. This kicked off Wednesday night right in front of this building with the awakening of the Groundhog. We first of all have to thank John Sherris and the Opera House and City staff for helping us put all of this together. You're here in the gem of Woodstock, the Woodstock Opera House, um, but John and his staff help us with the awakening of the Groundhog and this presentation and our ceremonies in the square. Uh, we couldn't do this without the help of the City of Woodstock. The main supporter of Groundhog Day, our corporate sponsor, is the Home State Bank, if you'd give it up for them. So we've had a busy day so far with a free showing of the movie, and if you like reliving Groundhog Day over and over again, there'll be another showing tomorrow morning at 10 at the Woodstock Theater. Uh, after Bob's presentation, uh, this evening from 5 till 8, a new event on the calendar this year is Groundhog Bingo, and that will be at the Blue Lotus Temple, which is a block south of the square. This evening from 6 to 10, a number of bars around town are taking part in the Groundhog Day pub crawl. You can go to the bar where Andy McDowell and Bill Murray drink to world peace. You can go to the bowling alley where Bill sits with a couple of locals debating whether his glass of beer is half full or half empty. So that's tonight's pub crawl. Uh, Groundhog Day is put together by a small group of volunteers, um, many of, of who are here. And if any of you are at all interested in joining us, bringing new ideas, or helping us organize, see any one of us. Uh, we enjoy our fun-filled few days that are free for most of the events, uh, charities for civic organizations. It's, it's just a lot of fun. And I would like to introduce at this time the co-chairs of the Groundhog Day Committee, Pam Morehouse and Craig Crandall. Thank you, Rick. Uh, first off, it's so great to have you all here. This is the first time they let us go on the big stage, though, which is awesome. Really love, really love that. So we've been doing this for, for many years. I've been on the committee for 13 years, Pam for 20 plus years. And we've been really blessed all these years that we've had the honor of having Bob Hudgens join us. Bob was the location manager for the film. He, lack of a better term, convinced, actually brought Harold Ramis to Woodstock and really started something that I don't believe any of us, and certainly Bob, and he'll share with you many fantastic stories, that it would have the legs that it, that it does, and that really it has changed many people's lives. The movie itself has, and certainly this event has changed the, the scenery here in Woodstock, and so we've been really, really fortunate. Uh, 25 years ago, Bob was here for a long time, and he's been coming back over and over and over, and he has told us that as much as he loves coming here from Austin, Texas, and leaving his chickens and his eggs at home, he said enough is enough. Which, you know what? I can't believe he's done this one. So really, we're so honored. We have a had a fantastic dinner the other night to share stories uh, with Bob. We have a limited time here today, so without further ado, fly from Austin, Texas. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, hi. I, uh, it's been a while, but I was on this stage once before, and uh, it was 25 years ago. And this was where we had our major town hall meeting, where I was begging and pleading at that point, and to say that my job was on the line is an understatement, that we uh, kind of put all our eggs in the one basket of asking the city of Woodstock to accept us and allow us to come film here. And so um, I'd had a series of smaller meetings with business owners um, all around the square, and uh, it led to this one big meeting where uh, this uh, things kind of had to, be, had to be determined because Columbia Pictures was getting a little anxious. I mean, they were already spending money in pre-production. Um, this is a business. This is, you know, yes, it was a movie, and there's all this creative component, but behind us were these guys going, 
look, do you really have this town to shoot in or not? And uh, this is the stage where I, I sat and uh, groveled and begged and pleaded and, uh, you know, uh, explained myself to the best of my ability as to an attempt to answer the questions that those residents of Woodstock at the time had. And um, I guess it worked out, because here we are 25 years later. But uh, I, I will I tell this story in a lot of ways, and for those that have been on the tour in the past and all these things, you should not expect anything from anything involving Groundhog Day but a repeat of the same stories over and over again. <laughs> so please, some of you have heard all of this before, and I apologize, but for you new folks, which I'm really thrilled that there is constantly new new uh, visitors to the city of Woodstock and appreciating its, uh, its glory, that uh, there was a, a group of business owners organized uh, to try and block our filming. And uh, they, you know, they were concerned that uh, we were going to come in and take over their town and you know, do irreparable harm to the square, to their businesses, and uh, all of these things. And now these are reasonable concerns. I don't, I'm not putting this, you know, making light of it at all. But they were asking me these questions that, you know, like, well, when are you going to do your filming? What are you going to do? And how long is it going to take? And all these questions, which are fair and reasonable questions. But in, in movie land, you kind of figure things out as you go. And it was really hard in a real honest, straightforward way to say, oh, on X date, we'll be here. And on Z date, we'll be there. No. Um, and especially in a film that it was 100% contingent on the weather. I mean, you know, here we are trying to do the same day over and over and over again. None of us had ever done that kind of a movie before. So it really was based on what the weather was like that day. And so we had to, to work that out. And I, you know, try as you might, some people thought I was just, oh, you know, not dealing with the truth and trying to tell them that, that I just didn't want to tell them what I really knew. The fact was, I didn't really know. And uh, I, was, I was a middle management guy. I wasn't the producer. And I had to answer to people like a wonderful producer by the name of Doc Erickson, a production designer by the name of David Nichols, um, Harold Ramis guy, you know, uh, different people that all had creative input in the process, and everyone kind of changed. The biggest change that happened through the course of our preparation was the fact that Gobbler's Knob, which in Punxsutawney takes place in a park outside of town. We did Gobbler's Knob on the square, and that radically changed the amount of impact on the, on the town itself because Instead of you know, doing most stuff out, uh, we were going to use uh, a park in McHenry on the Fox River. That's where we were going to do our Gobbler's Knob originally. And so when, the, when David Nichols, the wise guy David Nichols, had the idea of putting Gobbler's Knob on the square, my life went upside down because all of a sudden I had to get people to understand that we were going to actually build our gobbler's knob on the square and totally and physically tear up the square to do that and bring in all these extras into the square and all this activity, all our equipment, all this stuff was not, wasn't going to be here for three or four days. It was going to be here for like six weeks. So gosh, um, it was kind of hard to answer those questions. So this meeting this uh, at the Opera House was incredibly pivotal. But the good news for me was this was the point when, after these people organized, they got buttons made with the number 27 on it. Because there were 27 businesses that had come together to try and block the film. They hired an attorney. They, they approached city council in a very specific way to prohibit us from being able to you know, receive permission from the city to do our filming. So you know, this, was, this was a challenge. Well, it was at this meeting that I saw my first button with the number 14 on it because their ranks had diminished at that point down to 14. And so I knew we were, we were moving in the right direction. So I wasn't overconfident, but I felt really good when I was kind of realizing that fact that you know, we, were, we may be actually able to pull this off. Whew. So uh, it, it, uh, it all worked out. And uh, we had a, you know, a myriad of challenges as we went through the process. But you know, it, it took um, a lot of 
you know, personal contact. And uh, the way I like to do business is face to face, not, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm really grateful I, this was not made in the days of email, Twitter, or anything like that. I, I think people have a, a way of being very lazy in their communication, using electronic abilities to, to communicate when, you know, face to face, you can tell if a person's lying or not. And, uh, you know, you can tell about their sincerity. You can talk, talk to them in a way to, you can also see their body language to see if you've offended them in some way and if you can, you can fix that problem rather than let it fester. And so it really was dependent upon us having really, really good communication with the, the people in town to make that happen. Um, gosh, I can, I can kind of go on and on and on. Uh, through the years, there were so many stories that came out of this, this film that uh, it, it's, uh, you know, I'm sorry that I'm not gonna cover that much uh, by, by dint of only having an hour to, to talk to y'all. Uh, I can't tell them all. But, uh, you know, we, we started out, we did all, our, all of our exterior work first, and one of the first uh, major scenes that we had done uh, in the first week was the quarry scene, where Bill drives the, the pickup over the edge, and, uh, you know, there's all this driving sequence. And uh, it was something that, uh, you know, should have been not a big deal, it uh, was, we finished our principal photography work, second unit went back to the quarry, I believe, for other work, and, uh, but I know the, because it corresponded with the town of Woodstock kind of threw us a party the first Friday night of our, the end of our first week of filming in the courthouse. And there's, in, in the courthouse itself, there's a rather, you know, in the courtroom, we, we had a, a party. And it was very, very nice. All the people from the town came, and it was just, you know, the crew all kind of, you know, came straight from the, the quarry and, uh, and went to the, you know, went right to the bar. But, uh, you know, about half an hour into the event, uh, I'm standing there and I'm, I'm literally, I think, talking, if not to the mayor, to a couple of the city council people, and I see a, uh, a county sheriff pull up with its lights on. And, you know, in my line of work, I kind of can smell trouble when it's happening. And uh, I saw the police car, and then I saw the, the officer coming into the building. And, uh, and I was just like, oh my goodness, I don't know what happened, but I know this is, he's looking for me. And uh, sure enough. Uh, so I, uh, I kind of go to the top of the stairs, a really gorgeous staircase that goes up to the, the courtroom. And it, please go visit the courtroom if you haven't been inside there. It's really quite lovely. But uh, so I met the, but the, the sheriff at the top of the stairs, and, uh, and so his first question, who do I need to talk to, who's, and I said, well, I'm afraid uh, I'm that guy. Uh, what happened, and how can I help you? And he was like, well, uh, did you guys, uh, were you guys coming back on Kishwaukee Valley Road tonight? And I said, yes, sir. Um, that's how our, you know, our main equipment run from Love's Park, where the quarry was, back to Woodstock. Now, we had, uh, our facility that we used for our production office was the old Benoit car dealership, which was, you know, just off the square. The police station is there now, the new police station. But that's where our offices were, and we parked our equipment there. And so I, you know, was like, yes, uh, that's, that was our route. Uh, why? What happened? He goes, well, we had a little accident. I'm like, oh, really? Uh, what happened? Well, uh, there was, seems to be, uh, do you, any of your did you have some RVs or something? And I go, what do you mean? And he goes, well, you know, um, I think there were some portable toilets that discharged onto the Kishwaukee Valley Road. And I'm like, oh, really? Uh, that's not good. Um, I'm really sorry. And they go, and there was an elderly couple that was following the vehicle, and they, it splashed all over them. They could not see. They turned on the windshield wipers, and it got worse. And they ran off the road and had a crash. And uh, they were not hurt. <laughs> they were not hurt. They, you know, it's a fat, flat, you know, land pretty much. There's a lot of curves in the road, but it's, you know, primarily cornfields uh, to and from. But uh, they, they had run off the road, and yes, it was our fault. And uh, 
one of our, what we call our honey wagon, which is where we have dressing rooms for the actors, and they all have their own individual toilets. One of the seals of one of them, I, you know, I don't know how it happened, but uh, it did. And uh, so that was the end of our first week of filming. I didn't go to jail, and we, you know, took care of, of those folks in an extraordinary way. Um, believe me, I was very... <laughs> We were very generous to, uh, to make sure that they were not having a totally bad experience in their run-in with Groundhog Day. But uh, they, uh, they had a messy start. Let me say that we had a, a bit of a messy start with the, uh, the filming. But, uh, you know, it, it's, I tell you this story because it's indicative of things that are kind of outside your control, but you're still responsible for. And that's how filmmaking really is. I mean, you're out there, you're trying to do this project, you, you think you've covered all the bases, you've planned, but there's always these things that come in from left field that, oh my goodness, I've never anticipated this one before. And uh, you just have to deal with it and you have to work with the town to make it, make it right. And it's, uh, it helps if, in my position, if you're really a stubborn person. Because if you, if you let people tell you no, uh, you can't do that, and you know you, for your reasons, you need to really do that. You try to find a way to get to yes. And, uh, and so it's really interesting challenges that were, are presented to you. And this, this film did present us lots of challenges as we went through and, and were able to, uh, to make the film and, and get everybody on board eventually. And, uh, you know, for instance, I had to do a contract with every building on the square because we had cable running on the rooftops of all the way around the square. So I, we couldn't touch the building without an insurance policy. Um, I did so many roof inspections, I can't even begin to tell you. Um, and, and do contracts with every business, every building owner on the square. And so you, you learn that you have to do that. Even the people, you know, of course, of that 27 or 20 and then the 14, yes, I had to do contracts with those people as well. And so it really, you know, it teaches you don't make enemies and don't make permanent enemies because you're going to end up needing to come back and ask those people, you know, to participate in some way with you. And so it's really a, an interesting process when you're making a film that it's really a team sport. I mean, an absolute team sport. To that point, um, the folks of Woodstock, you have one member of that team that's a permanent resident. And I'm going to ask him to come up here with me uh, because uh, he's not only someone who works in the industry at a very, very high level. Uh, re recently, I, I, I've had the pleasure of, of working with Rick uh, on a, a TV show called Chicago Fire, which was my last job as a, a location manager. I retired from the business, but uh, he's still hard at it. And, uh, and doing all those little Dick Wolf shows that are in uh, Chicago right now. He's, uh, I'm not sure if you get to play on them all, but I think you're playing on all of them. Yeah, pretty close. So, uh, but uh, Rick had the, the pleasure of being the one Woodstock resident who worked on Groundhog Day. And as a stuntman, he's the guy who jumped out of this building. And uh, I want to have Rick come up and join me because you probably have more questions for him than you do me anyway. But uh, <laughs> so uh, Rick Lefevre, right. you. you too, man. Good to see you. Uh, please. And uh, you know he's somebody that I just God we've gotten you know we when we started my first job. And I, that I, I think I'm, I met you on was a TV show called Lady Blue. Mm. And anybody? Dirty Harriet. Dirty Harriet, yes. Uh, a bad ABC series that did uh, 13 episodes and they didn't air them all. Um, and so uh, I was a production assistant. I got hired because I could shovel snow like, mm, you know. <laughs> And uh, because of my excellence in, in shovel, shoveling snow, they let me be a location scout. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I ended up, uh, that was my break in the business. I went from snow shoveler to scout number 23, who, uh, you know, was driving around my, my first day on Lady Blue. I had to find a bathroom in Little Vietnam up, in, uh, up on North, uh, 
Broadway in Chicago, and I had to talk somebody into letting us come from our set where it was a restaurant and shoot an insert scene of a medicine cabinet. And med base, uh, pardon me, bathrooms are really hard to film in because they're so small. And back then, the cameras were, you know, the big 35 millimeter cameras that were this long. You try to put one of those inside a bathroom. So I'm knocking on doors, and no one spoke English. And I was pretty scruffy, uh, very scruffy. And I, I was uh, out of the service at that point, and I still wore my, my army jacket, and I looked like, you know, somebody you should not let in your house. <laughs> so I, you know, and, uh, but I, I met these guys because they had a, I think they had a blast on that show because they got to crash and shoot out and, yeah, um, yeah. The police show, so I shoot them up. I yeah. Shoot them up, car chases, yeah. So, but, so we go back a couple years. That was 1985. So, uh, you know, we've known each other. Quite a while. But, just wanna, just oh, so no, please. Just want to say something, you know. Oh. oh thank you. Uh, about Bob, you know, uh, I'm always amazed. That, if I do the math right, it's been 25 years since we shot this movie. Right? Yeah. And uh, he's been back here every year since. And I've been to a lot of them, and I'm always amazed that so many people still love this movie. And it's that this life that goes on and on and on, just like the movie. You know? Yeah. So I know Pam and some of the people here, Bob's a big part of this, and uh, I thank him for keeping the movie going. And the tour, you know, the information, he, he knows where all the bodies are buried. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he knows all the backstories. But as big as he is to uh, Groundhog's Day, like he said, we've had a whole career together. He's a major icon huh. in the Chicago film community. We've done a lot of big. Uh, other projects, movies yeah. and TV over the years, and we, we miss him. He retired a year or so ago, so uh, I want to thank you, Bob, for cool. being a big part of it. Thank so, you. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Well, thank you. I'm glad it's true. <laughs> so I, I'd like for you to kind of tell us, because, you know, he came out, I, I was, you know, fortunate enough that I was at the very, very first stages of this, this project. I was in the van with Harold, when before they even cast Andy McDowell, um, you know that was it was really a lot of fun listening to the conversations about potential actresses for, you know, who Bill would like, who there'd be good chemistry, and uh, who would put up with Bill, and uh, <laughs> so uh, you know there there's there's variables there, but uh, it was really fun and how the film progressed. So Rick came in after things had kind of maybe settled in a little more, yeah. but there's a lot of stunt work on this film. I mean, you don't, I mean, think about it. For, for one, I didn't thought I'd get the job because it was close to home. You know, we, were, we go to another part of the world to work, but I was lucky enough to get the job. There was a, a great person on the show, Doc Erickson, who uh, first approached me about the job, and one of the best guys I've ever worked for. Yeah. Yeah. So I got the script, and it just had, Bill does this, Bill does this, Bill does this, and his character, it didn't really say what he did. So Harold was kind of making a lot of it up. At the time, we'd walk around the square, we call a location scout with Bob, and he'd go, can you jump off of that? You know? <laughs> can we run you down this track? We, you know, how many ways can we kill Bill? You know, <laughs> this thing's in town, so I was like, the crash test dummy for, for Harold. You know? and, uh, so it was fun to be part of the, the creative process of that. Yeah, you really did, because honestly, you know, if, if you ever see a, a, a film script, it really is, you know, and you know, like in Gandhi, and the masses followed, and it's just like, okay, how do you deal with the hundred thousand extras? And you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so it was really this. This script was chock full of, you know, all these different things that, uh, and some were cut. Uh, you know, uh, you didn't get blown up, um, except in the, I guess, in the pickup truck, there's a you blow up, but uh, there was. A, the bank job where originally where he walks in and he blows himself up in a bank. And, uh, right, a lot of the, the, the scenes that we shoot sometimes, just uh, the pacing of the movie or might be too much, a little dark, some of the stuff where we were killing him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember Harold pointed to the tower here, which is kind of the icon moment of the film because it's such a beautiful building too, you know. He's like, you're sure? I'm trying to do my Harold's voice, but we can do that. You know, I'm like, yeah, I, I can do that. And that day we actually did it, he was kind of like, you don't have to do this. He came up to me twice. So you, only if you feel you can do it, I go, Harold, I got it. You know, Bill was in a pair of uh, blue pajamas where I had a, had a trench coat and uh, pajamas and slippers. And all I wanted to do was get off the thing because it was like as cold as it was today. He kept coming yeah. up to me and making sure I was okay. I go, just roll the camera. Right. I want to get down there as fast as I can. Yeah, it was really, you know, and a lot of driving work. And uh, you don't realize how tough driving work is. 
I mean, <laughs> well, especially in the square, it's all cobblestones. For us, that's like being on ice. You know, and uh, uh, Bill, would, he kept telling me he didn't want the Dukes a hazard, but he'd hear us spinning the wheels, and he goes, Bill wouldn't drive that way. <laughs> Everything Bill wouldn't drive that way. Well, you know, it was always like trying to pick his mind, uh, his brain a little bit. And when we did the takeoff from the, uh, the courthouse, the, the pickup truck was a big block shed. We had a big engine in it. And I go, how fast do you want me to go? And I had to drive everything with this little ground dog doll in my lap. You know? <laughs> and the truck, the door wouldn't stay shut. It was an old truck. We, you know, sometimes we don't get the newest stuff, but we try to make it safe. He goes, I just want you to go as fast as you can. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so uh, it's not, you don't tell stuff, man. That, you know, that, that. <laughs> Heavy left foot, and uh, I hit the gas and just spun the wheel for about uh, like 10 minutes. You know? Smoked out the whole square, went sideways down the street. Went, made a left here, went by the. Uh, police station over here, the old courthouse there. And the door flew open, there was gas spraying out of the back. And, <laughs> came out. and then the other, the van chases me in this, the mayor's car and the squad car. So I come back, the whole square is like, it's like a bug fogger went off down there. I go up to him like, uh, what do you think, Carol? He goes, well, that was pretty good for the fuel dragster version. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but uh, speaking of take ones, the, the, the high fall, Oh, yeah, one take. Yeah, yeah it yeah. was it was glorious. I, I have to say, I had a good view of it, and uh, you were you nailed it. So yeah, Bill, he, was, he gave me some notes. He didn't want any like times we do falls. So it doesn't look like a demo. We do a lot of movement, kicking, and screaming all the way. And he just wanted Bill just to be as still as he could, just hinge and just go, which is kind of harder for us to do because yeah. we need that body movement to land right. So. Yeah. It was tricky to hold that position all the way in. But that's yeah, because he, he needs to land on his back coming into the bag, right. you know. And so the bag, we, we you know, shut down this little section of the street. He inflated the bag there, and, uh, and so, it, Correct, yeah. yeah. And there was no tree there. There's, they planted some trees there. It would be very problematic. <laughs> We're off the, uh, the east side of the building right here. Yeah. So it, uh, but it, very nice job. Because, I mean... <laughs> It was a fun movie to work on. I mean, we had such a talented cast, and uh, like yourself and Doc, and you know Trevor Albert, and um, uh, every day was like an adventure. It was almost like uh, we were at camp because everybody was on location except for me because I lived. Yeah, you I really. Was, I go home for lunch. I had my pager back then. They, Harold wants to see it. You know, did the punch over here with Phil. You know that whole thing there. What do you want to do there? So I come in 15 minutes before I have to go to work, which was Amazing. first and only time in yeah. my whole career that's ever happened. So. But it was a great experience. It was like uh, everybody was together in town. It was like one big family here. So it was a. It was a Did you ever make any of the Crazy Eights, Eights games at Michael Haley's house? Or? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We had yeah. the movie yeah. night over at the theater. We always, you know, oh. had, uh, it was Chinese films. We had Chinese food. It yeah. was uh, sort of international film festival. Or Italian film. We had Italian food. Yeah. And the baseball games were with the hogs. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was like a big family experience. Yeah, we really had fun. I, I have to say that was really a remarkable. I haven't had that experience even on Rudy. We were kind of, yeah, yeah but it wasn't the same. It wasn't at all. But uh, this because of the square, and we were all pretty proximate. Very it, close. Yeah. yeah. No, couldn't get away. Yeah. It's like yeah. Ground yeah. Ground. yeah. <laughs> and, and so we had such a good time. And again, I, I just mentioned a guy named Michael Haley. <clears throat> Michael, you see in the movie a lot because he's one of the guys on Gobbler's Knob. But he was the, the field general. He was the first assistant director. And he'd done all of Mike Nichols' films. I mean, this guy was as good an AD I, I ever worked with. Right. And I mean, it was just, that was the thing. It, it was like everybody was at the top of their game. I mean, the cinematographer, John Bailey, I mean, gosh, everybody involved was a lot of A-listers. And then there were the comedians. I mean, yeah. the, the Chris and you know Brian Doyle and all of those guys, Steve Dobolowski. I mean, Lord. I mean, it was just. <laughs> there was a lot of improv too with those guys. Yeah, there was the script, but like some of the stuff that Chris, even the the Corey, when the, the truck goes in the first time, we did two of them. They landed exactly the same way. It was amazing. In pretty much yeah. the same spot. But that line where he goes, well, maybe he's okay, and then the truck is like, no, maybe no. <laughs> he kind of made that up, and Harold loved it. You know, that's one of the one, you know, which I think is one of the best lines in the movie. It is. <laughs> no, yeah, the timing, you know, because the comedic timing for all those guys is really, really quite good. Right. So, yeah, yeah, it's a lot of fun. So, yay. Any questions about the stunts we did yeah. on the show? Or? Yes, ma'am. Oh, gosh, I work with Andy again on a film called Michael, 
and uh, which was a, a, another road picture that we were kind of, we were down, actually did, it was supposed to be Iowa, but we actually did it outside of Austin. That's what got me to Austin, actually, was the film Michael. And Andy was so nice. Um, you know, she was really a lovely person. Uh, she had different husbands at uh, the two movies, but, uh, you know, <laughs> she, she was... <laughs> But, uh, you know, it was really, you know, that was, I mean, I, w I would have loved to have worked with Chris Elliott again. Um, gosh, he made me laugh. I worked on Bill one more time after that. Some of the crew members we'd seen, but I uh, worked on Bill on Zombieland like 10 years ago. It's the last time I saw him. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's just kind of, it's like who's available when. And so there's these circles that... You know, I've been very fortunate to get to work with Rick as many times, A, because we're both, we were Chicago guys, and so, you know, it, uh, it happens more often for us because we were kind of an exception. We were both local department heads that that was pretty rare back in the feature film world because most of the time, all the department heads they would bring in from L.A., and so for them to hire, you know, local guys as department heads was, you know, Pretty flattering for us, but uh, also rare. But that's why we kind of have, you know run into each other as much as we have. I think so. Now it's changed because there's been so much more production activity. There's a lot more you know Chicago crew that is really thank you John Hughes. That's expanded uh, quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. and uh, John Hughes really kind of broke the door down for Chicago crew being taken seriously, which. I am very, very happy that you know we got to play in Hughes Land, and that's true too. A few of his movies, not quite like this, but some of his hold up too. You know, John. Yeah, well, it's on the map in Chicago. A lot of the films like Ferris Bueller. And stuff yeah, like I I miss working on Ferris Bueller by this much, <laughs> and uh, Planes Trains was my first John Hughes movie. Which, so which out here too, yeah. yeah, which yeah, which we did. So. When they did the truck scene in the quarry, how, how did you do that, or how, how was that done, where it exploded? We had two shells of the, the pickup, which means there's no motor in it. Okay. And we just called a two to one, the truck's launching towards the cliff, and we pulled a truck pulled the other way through a shiv, a series of pulleys. So the truck's going the opposite way, it just launches off what we call it a pelican hook, and launches into the quarry. I luckily, because the effects guys didn't want to drive it, because it takes it hooked onto the truck, put it a little over the edge, I had to drive the truck going the other way with the door open to jump out, just in case it didn't release. So they didn't want to do it, and they were looking at me like, I think the stunt guy should do it. <laughs> He'll do anything. <laughs> yeah. But it went well. We did it twice, just a, a couple different angles. And I said, it's amazing that it landed almost in the same spot, and in the same way that was in one of Brian Arts' rooftop. Yeah, that was a great scene. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Well, that was, uh, it was actually Bill and Harold. They uh, wanted to, they're both from Chicago, and they wanted to be able to work close to their families. And so uh, that was the determination that wagged the dog. They, you know, Bill Murray at that, you know, was, Columbia Pictures was doing, how, we, how may we help you, Mr. Murray? And so, uh, you know, and the other component is actually creatively, if you go to the real place for a real event like this, you're kind of locked into doing it their way. And so I really felt Harold wanted the freedom of being able to tell their story in a more expansive way, and which they certainly did. So. It was the square, too, it's not the same. There. Right, right. That's, yeah, that was the, yeah, that's my, my story is your, Woodstock owes a huge thank you to Baraboo, Wisconsin. Because we, initially, I scouted nothing but Main Street towns, because that was what we were looking for something like Punxsutawney. And so after looking at a lot of towns, we ended up in a town called Mineral Point, Wisconsin. And uh, Mineral Point was okay, but uh, you know, Harold was just, it was a little too big and a little too stretched out. It didn't have the compactness. Movies kind of need a set. You know, it's like you put the camera on and you get a really nice frame right there. So uh, after we left Mineral Point, I drove east, and we ended up having lunch in Baraboo. And Baraboo is where the circus used to summer. And, uh, and so they had all these fanciful uh, you know, things, elephant head trash cans, and all sorts of circus-themed things, which you see David Nichols stole shamelessly from uh, Baraboo. That he, that's how we ended up with the Groundhog Day head trash cans and all that other stuff. 
So, uh, you know, it, we came out of our diner and uh, walked around the square a couple times. Harold said, hey, is there a town square closer to Chicago? And lo and behold, here we are. So, yeah. Yes, ma'am. During the filming, that was an extra in the film. They come out to us extras and asked if we wanted to leave Woodstock and go film Home Alone, which was filming at Lincoln Park Zoo. And they said 25 of you would have to take all your stuff and just leave. Nobody left. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's you know it it's, it was Holzer Ridge I think was the extras casting agent, right, right. and so they were they had both shows, <laughs> and so that's why they were. Right. Yeah. Uh, the early parts of the Crazy Plains was when they did the steps sequence. Just the coming down the steps of the uh, the courthouse, then um, where they get in the back of the semi. Uh, which was on Main Street, kind of facing uh, north, and then um, then the Hunts gas station over uh, at the Five Way intersection. So I think those were the three. Yeah, because we were only here, I believe, two days of shooting. We spent about three days prepping the courthouse. There used to, the restaurant had an awning that used to stick out. We took that down, changed out a whole bunch of stuff on the courthouse. So our department and construction, we did a lot of prep, but it wasn't much filming here at all. So. How do I say this? The best? Yeah, he was great. I mean, he was just like you'd see him in a film. He, yeah, we used to play hockey with him. He was, he's a big hockey fan. He made us come and play. He had his, back then it was a high tech you know, toy hockey game. He yeah. played the Canadian national anthem. He had us stand up and sing it with him. <laughs> played the American national anthem. And, you know, we played like four in the morning on the town. We got to be at work here. You know, six. And he'd be like, don't worry, I'll cover for you. Know, so it's nice to be very, very sad. <laughs> Yeah, I, I will tell you, my, my favorite story of all my personal experiences in filmmaking was um, there's a scene in Planes, Trains where John Candy is hawking shower curtain rings to people in a bus station. It was the old Trailway Station on uh, Randolph in downtown Chicago. And uh, it was towards the end of our schedule. And is, I think it's safe to say that Steve Martin and John Hughes kind of didn't always get along, but John Candy and John Hughes really, really liked each other. And so there was this scene where John was, he was just gonna be John kind of doing this ad lib session of uh, you know selling these shower curtain rings to people in the bus station. And we set up three cameras, and and Hughes was just like, hey, John, just just do it, you know? And so I was in Behind, there was a, a little soda fountain counter in the room that I was kind of sitting down behind. And because I had, I had to pull, unplug the refrigerator unit on the, uh, in the, in the, the fountain. And so I was, I unplug it and then plug it back in after the take because they were real worried that their stuff was going to go off. So I was like, okay. So I was huddled down behind the counter. And, and John started this scene. And we had back, you know, again, non-digital, this was all uh, real film, and we had 1,000-foot mags, which, uh, four minutes, right? Yeah, about, yeah. So uh, they, would, they would run for four minutes. Well, the assistant camera people had extra mags standing by, but once John started, he just kept the, John Hughes just kept the cameras rolling, and so they kept, they'd do a camera reload, a camera reload, and you saw the eight camera assistants dashing out and grabbing more magazines and coming back. He went on for 40 solid minutes. <laughs> and I, I was just like, in my whole life, I was in my fetal position. I was laughing so hard, I was crying, and it was just like, oh, oh please stop him, please stop him, you know, and, but no one would, because only John Hughes could stop John Candy. And it was just like, after 40 minutes, I mean, and that was, so that was three, three cameras times easily 10 magazines each, so 30,000 feet of film. He shot. Oh God! And and finally, John Hughes just got up and he goes, "We give, we give." And the entire crew just got up and gave Don Candy a standing ovation. And it was just like we were like in my whole life, you'll just never have another experience like that. So I don't think were you there that day or you? No oh, man, it was just remarkable. And that kind of John and it was like John Candy knew he was making us hurt. 
It was like he, he was going to laugh us to death. And, and he really had that capacity of, of doing that. And he was just, uh, you know, I had another, uh, well, I, don't, I didn't come to tell John Candy stories, but, uh, but suffice it to say, Mr. Candy was, I was, I was also working in, at, at Hughes Land when, uh, when John passed. And I have to say it was one of the saddest days ever on a, on a film. It was Baby's Day Out, and yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. so, <clears throat> excuse me. So, uh, remarkable man. Did you guys shoot the uh, scene at Steve Martin's house in Chicago? Where was that? Uh, it was actually in Kenilworth. Yes, sir, yeah. And that we shot that at, yeah. It, that was uh, another well-positioned house at the end of a street, and uh, it was the only movie that's ever shot in Kenilworth, I'm proud to say. Uh, they were a real tough customer to I actually got arrested uh, <laughs> scouting. Uh, you know, Kenilworth, if you're from Chicago, you know that that's fairly much the high rent district. And I was going door to door. Again, I was a scruffy looking guy and knocking on doors and leaving leaflets. And the, the police came up and said, sir, you know, you're, uh, you're breaking the law. Uh, you're soliciting and we have a no solicitation policy in Kenilworth and I was like, but these are letters from the State Film Commission and I, uh, well, please, please, and he said, would you get in the car, please? And uh, so the, Ron Verkylan get got me out of jail, thank you, Ron. So uh, yeah, it's the perils of the job, I guess, but uh, yes, sorry. Yes, sir. Uh, when you filmed, I, I assume you drove down railroad tracks? Yeah. <laughs> when you pulled out in front of the engine, was the car off the tracks already? Was that film magic, or did you actually just have a close call? <laughs> we had a close call. <laughs> Are you from the city? Yes. It was down at the train museum. That yeah, part. we've been there many yeah. times. Yeah. We got on the tracks right over here, and I kept telling Harold, there was another out of the front wheel drive car, which meant nothing to him. He just liked the look of it. It was a terrible car to do what we were doing with. Of course. They don't spin well. You know, uh, like I said, the cobblestones were a big issue. We were chasing around the square. That thing was like a boat on ice. I mean, yeah. when I drifted around the corner, I was like, not that building, not that building, not that car, not that car, not that building. And I had to go backwards down the street down here, and pretty much I used my mirrors all the way down the street and threw it around that reverse 90 onto the tracks there. What we had to do is um, we got foam-filled tires because the regular tires would explode. They're bulletproof tires. So going through the, uh, the, the rails and the, the ties, it wouldn't pop the tires. And uh, we found out we had to chain down or not, we did chain down the one, but the batteries, so the batteries go flying out too. So, so it was hard to hold speed the faster. I went the more it chattered the whole car. I couldn't see. I was bouncing so much, it was like somebody shaking you to death, you know. So that one made a little ramp there. You know, I knew how fast the train was coming, but when you're going right at it, it's kind of it's hard to tell. So uh, I think I guessed right. You know, so yes, you did. Carol said we got it. I was glad we got it. One. Move on to the next one, though. So. The scene with the big beer mugs, where was that actually filmed? It, that was a German restaurant in Chicago at the corner of uh, Roscoe and uh, Lincoln. Yeah, it was, um, and it, it does not exist anymore. And it was, it was La, Das Heidelberg House, I believe. You know, sorry, it, it, it didn't last much longer, but it was, uh, we went in and that was, it was dressed. I mean, that was, we didn't add anything to that restaurant at all, and it was, uh, was that yeah. Was the filming scene also in that hotel, or no? Yes, I believe I it was. was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the public house didn't have a restaurant at the time? There was a restaurant there that had closed, a, an earlier iteration of a restaurant, yeah. Modern public houses actually were in public houses, a great deal of future? Yes. I'm not sure what they've done after the fact, uh, because it, it has, it, there has been, I don't know how many versions of the restaurant there have been since we, because that one had already closed that I was aware of, because it was the one that I had to, to close down on planes, trains, and automobiles. It was closed by the time we came with Groundhog Day, so I'm not sure how many variations are. Yeah, there used to be a little more access to the jail cells, I know. And I think so. You could eat lunch in there, if I remember correctly, yeah. it used to be a part of the restaurant. Yeah. So. so, sorry. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Hey, I, I've got a question. Um, it's regarding uh, locations. So, um, it's kind of out of left field, but I know this uh, 
this opera house is able to be haunted. Um, but I wondered if, you know, as a location scout, you heard any stories uh, of a paranormal event um, locally? Uh, I did. The only thing I've known about, there is a, uh, an eight-sided house out in Bull Valley. And that is, I'm sorry? The Stickney Home. Thank you very much, the Stickney Home. And it, it, I, it was creepy. Uh, I have to say, I did go through it. I photographed it. And nothing came up on my film. And, uh, but it was a creepy little house, absolutely. But it was, you know, an eight-sided. There were no corners in the house. And what, what were you, what were you uh, for? Oh, just because I liked it. I'm, I, you know, I, I mean, in my line of work, you can never see too many things. And when the chief of police of a place says, hey, you want to go see a haunted house? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> of course. I, I, you know, I, I, it's like, I, I, I wanna t I'm going to tell you another story that this is, you, I don't know if you've ever heard this one. Um, I was working on uh, um, a Schwarzenegger movie called Red Heat at the time. And we were doing this uh, sequence um, in a diner that was supposed to be part of the state of Illinois, the old state of Illinois building, you know, that, and the gentleman who owned it also owned a restaurant that was over by uh, Union Station. So I go to meet the guy over at Union Station and uh, to do a contract with him there. And uh, so I'm sitting there and, you know, having, you know, coffee with the guy, doing the contract, and uh, when we're just about done, he goes, hey, have you ever seen a double-sized basement? And I'm like, no, but, you know, I'd love to see it, sir. And so he goes, well, come on. And so we go down a flight of stairs, and uh, we walk towards this wall in this kind of a, just a regular basement-feeling place, and we walk towards the end of the hall. I'm thinking, well, what the hell are you doing? I'm, uh, where are we going here? So you walk up to this, and it was a, a false wall that you would step to one side, and then you could slide through, and when you come out, you were at the top of a two-story staircase that went down into this amazing garage. And I was just like, oh my God, what is this? And he goes, well, I, they used to they keep cars there, and uh, evidently they used to bring booze in uh, during the Depression, that this was because there were these tunnels. If you think where Union Station is, it's right off the river. There were tunnels that went to Union Station and to the river. And there were railroad tracks that went through it, and a ramp that went to the adjacent parking garage that was a 14-foot door for trucks to go out. It was a liquor distribution point for Capone. <laughs> and what was really funny was this was about six months after Geraldo <laughs> <laughs> went into the Lexington Hotel and didn't find anything. And this was wonderful. I mean, I, I, the photos of this are, you know, I, I really need to bring out because these need to go to the Historical Society because there were the, in the center of the room was a concrete block room. And inside were still all the files, all the books, these giant ledgers of, you know, this whiskey coming in from this Canadian place. And, you know, it was just like, Oh my lord, there were uh, half a dozen old cars that were junk. There were some old trucks that were literally, they just, it's like they closed the doors, they sold the building, and no one had ever known. He said, Yeah, I had the building like 10 years before we even found this. You know, it was really remarkable. So, talking about, you never say no as a locations person. You're like, Sure, whatever, show me your interesting thing, please. Because that one was like, Oh my god. I, in my whole life, I told Andy Davis about it, and it was just like Andy was like, I took Andy down there, because he was, I, well, Andy Davis is a director who's based in Chicago early on, and I, yeah, that little movie, and uh, we were working on the package, and, uh, and so I took Andy over there, and he was just like, oh my God, oh my God, I've got to write something for this. This is like the most amazing place. So, but it was the real deal. I mean, it was the real place where the distribution points, the boats would come in, you know, off of Lake Michigan, they would come up and dock. They would unload uh, the, the whiskey and then put it on trains for distribution at farther points and then onto trucks as well. It was an amazing place. And all underneath this building that was, looked like a parking garage across the street from Union Station. And so it was on the corner of Jackson and Adams. And uh, yeah, 
Yeah, not Jackson and Adams, those are parallel streets. Uh, Jackson and, uh, pardon me, and uh, Wacker. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, we run into all sorts of things, ma'am. Uh, it's just goofy what we do. <laughs> are there any pictures of the actual constructions of the sets? Yes, there are, and they are in the library here in Woodstock. They have gotten a pretty good uh, archive going of all. Well, you gave it to us. Well. <laughs> 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 building over in Carrot, where we built most of the interiors. So yeah, those, yeah, yeah. And so, but, and then Dave Nichols gave us all the so set design and all those things we donated to the library. So uh, I was really proud of the fact that, you know, when we finished the film, again, most movies, when they wrap, you take everything back, to, you know, they put them on trucks, and they ship it all back to the studio in L.A. Um, on this film, when we finished, all the, the artifacts that we created for the movie we donated to the District 200, which is the Woodstock School District. And, uh, and a, a school district foundation was, was formed out of that. And uh, to this day, they still are giving grants away to, uh, to deserving teachers for, for programs uh, that they'd otherwise not have funding for. But, uh, you know, it, was, I, it would be different. I think, it, you know, they had the auction as quick as they could. You know, and uh, I, the auction was actually before the film even came out, if I recall correctly. And I think if they had waited a few years, I think they would have seen the, the a much they would have re received a lot more money for what they had, because uh, there would have been a lot more uh, interest in the uh, the stuff once the movie was really popular and there was this, uh, oh my gosh, uh, you know, afterlife that it has. Yeah. Yeah, they just want to use it. Yeah. Keep down with it and move on. So yeah. They, a lot of uh, movie uh, memorabilia that uh, a lot of it's gone. Some people collect a lot of it, especially in Chicago. But uh, yeah, it's funny you don't realize until you know 25 years later what the film's going to do. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Yes, sir. Seems like as a location manager, you're wearing a ton of different hats. You're a contract person. You're a lawyer. You're a painter. You're a how many different jobs are you? Like, what specifically are you responsible for besides pretty much everything but running the film? I don't sign the checks. <laughs> I don't jump out of buildings. <laughs> but, you know, the, I, that's actually one of the reasons I liked the job as much as I did because it goes through different phases. You go through this wonderful honeymoon creative phase where... You know, everybody loves the script, everybody loves the story, all, everyone's getting along, and uh, then you are the person who has to implement all those ideas that are, you know, the creative things and then the logistic things you have to put together. But yeah, it, it really does. It goes from the phase where I'm just driving around in the country taking pictures of stuff. You know, I was on a, I, my, the best movie for that for me was Michael, where we originally we were gonna shoot the film in Iowa, and Gerard Depardieu was going to be the angel. And, uh, and then they, the studio decided there was this John Travolta guy had, uh, had had a good year, and they wanted to use him as the angel. That pushed our, pushed our schedule to a February start. And we, it was really important to have it be fall look because we're setting up a Christmas tree in Chicago. So the timing of it was not dead of winter, Iowa. So that's why we ended up in Texas. But the fact was, I was given this amazing assignment. Go, you know, Nora Ephron was the director on that. And she called and said, Bob, you just go find me Iowa somewhere. It'll be decent, decently warm in February. And uh, you've got six weeks. And just, I drove. And I never got on an interstate highway the entire time. I left Chicago, went all the way to the East Coast, down through northern Florida, back across. And I just drove around and looked at stuff and trying to find interesting towns and old motels and uh, all sorts of stuff. So, you know, that phase of the job is really fun. There's no pressure, there's just, hey, interesting stuff, talk to people, you meet the most interesting people. Oh my gosh, it was, it was, it's just really a lot of fun. Then it moves into the contract phase where you have to really nail things down, start being talking about budgets and, and really executing the business side of things. And then you move into production which is the biggest variable, because you never know what's going to happen on the day. And then you, you're the problem solver, you're the fixer on, on the set. And then it goes to res restoration, making everything whole again, and uh, all of that, and you're done. So it's, what I liked about it was it's, it sees through the process, other than, you know, I'm not part of the editing process at all, but 
I get to go through that entire you know, dynamic and range of activity uh, uh, that a film does. So it's a lot of fun, because every day is different. And every film is different. And what you don't see when we land, there's an army of people. You know, in front of the camera, see the actors and the extras. Behind it, on the square for Bob, there's an army of people, our crew and trucks. It's like you're invaded, you know, but we all are respectful of uh, locations because we want to burn. We'd love to come back, especially in a town like Woodstock. So for him, he does things like for me to get permission to jump over there. I mean, most people look at like, what are you nuts? You know, it's like we're going to slide cars around. And uh, so it's very important what they do because we get the script. Harold gives us some ideas. Bob finds the locations they love to look, but then he's got to make the deal and make everybody happy. And a big part of this is like, so we don't want to burn location. We want to come back. And at the end, uh, you know, Fix if anything I got moved or repainted. Uh, it's a big, it's a big job. It's one of those uh, jobs in a movie that's the unsung hero sometimes because there's a lot of jobs like that. You know, if you look at the crew list, at the end, what's the gaffer? What's the dolly gripper? There's all these weird names, but there's a lot of guys that go into this movie like a team effort, like Bob said. Without yeah. that, it wouldn't get done. Yeah, I mean, I'm only as good as my yeah production team. Yeah. 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 Oh, no. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I you know, it, it's uh, like my last project, Chicago Fire. How many people? We had like 16, 17 people in the department. So they started trying to say I didn't do it. You know, it was a, you know, for them it was a nightmare. So now there's, there's two or three guys in the job you did alone right now, and that's the truth. Bob, Groundhog Day's got some incredibly funny lines. How much of that was, I mean, was it just Harold writing? Or did, he, did Harold let Bob go off script? Well, I don't think... I don't think Bill. you could ever keep Bill from not ad-libbing. <laughs> and that's the thing, that was, that was the, the, the you know, factor of the comedians that we had in that film. My God, there were so many talented, funny people. How would you, how could you rein them in? There is a script of the guideline, but like you said, there's so many talented people, a lot of those were, you saw the ones they picked, just like the John Candy story, they probably did a bunch of different versions. And the one they like the best, they think it's going to work. But some are one and only, like the one that I said Chris Elliott said, and some of the stuff over there where Steve was getting punched and hugging him on the street there, Phil, you know, that uh, yeah. a lot of those were just yeah. on take. Yeah. A lot of they experimented with it. And I tried again, let me do something a little different. Yeah. But Harold was really, I mean, that's the difference in the directors. I mean, some directors go, no, this is how it is. It would be this. Walter Hill was like, no nonsense. I mean, you did it Walter Hill's way or you were looking for a job. But, uh, you know, Harold, I mean, A, he knew these, all these guys were his friends. So I think there was a lot of camaraderie and, yeah, give it a shot. Do what you think. And then it may be funnier than what I had in mind. Right. So, but it was his generosity that made it happen. I, I know your scene ended up on the proverbial cutting room floor. Yes. Whatever actually happens to all these, is it ever archived or is it actually just destroyed? The, old, the film that's part of the star not. Well, I'm sure they're archived. I mean, they end I up in the. It's better now that, you know, the yeah. old days they used to throw it away. A lot of the old movie houses used to bury it under the movie houses to get rid of it. They're finding a lot of old films, you know, maybe in Kansas now, an old movie theater. So they're, they're taking care of a lot of it now. Uh, it's better than it used to be. And it's digital now, so it's easier. <laughs> yeah, we you're seen in the, in the yeah. churches somewhere buried in the archives. Somewhere. <laughs> Columbia Pictures, you know, probably in their editing. Uh, they don't give you a copy. <laughs> no, they own the rights. I, I got a whole reel of stunts that never made it in the film. Yeah, you can see it sometime, you know, some stuff we did, you know, yeah. maybe not in this movie. Harold was in one of the scenes, wasn't he? Yeah, he played the psychiatrist. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which we shot in the mayor's office, which, uh, you know. People coming to town asking about the bed and breakfast. Tell us about the bed and breakfast. Well, that was uh, the second thing that Harold did. I mean, after we spent our few minutes here at the bell tower and, and looking at the square, um, you know, we got back in the van, we're headed back to Chicago, and, uh, you know, Harold goes, so, oh, so where's the bed and breakfast? You know, <laughs> and kind of busting. And so I, I drove to the five corner intersection and turned down Madison and literally halfway down the block, you know, the house presents itself so well that he was like, that'll be great. He looked to David Nichols and David, he said, what do you think? He, David said, that's perfect. And so literally, I even got to the corner, we stopped for a minute and he said, do you guys want to get out and walk around? And he said, no, that's good. Take us back to Chicago. You know, so the next morning I went and this is actually uh, the, kind of the fun part was I called my friend at the, the film office because, you know, 
this is one of those situations, um, and I'd already worked for John Hughes at this point, so I knew, you know, when John Hughes would go, John Hughes had, on the, the house we used in Plains Trains, John found that house and sent me to Kenilworth. I would have never scouted Kenilworth because Kenilworth was famous for never letting movies come there. So John Hughes could care less that Kenilworth had a no film policy. Uh, they literally had a no film policy. So, you know, this was a situation where the director is picking that house, it's perfect, drive me back to Chicago, we're done here. And I'm like, no pressure, <laughs> I've got one option, make it happen. And so I called my friend at the Film Commission, uh, uh, Ron Verkylan, who, you know, as actually plays a role in all of this, he was the first guy that they brought in from, I think, outside the community about getting the, the Groundhog Day committee together and he was a big supporter of that. So, uh, you know, anyway. Uh, so Ron and I show up at this, uh, this house at the bed and breakfast and knock on the door. Very nice woman opens the door and, you know, we, I, you know, it, it's one of those things of tricks of the trade. When you pull up to somebody's house, you look at the real door they use. You know, you can tell where people go in their home, especially a big house like that. You could go, they never use the front door. They always go to the side door. So I go to the side door. You know, it shows a familiarity. There's something, uh, it really disarms people in, in usually a good way if you're courteous, et cetera. And so I knock on the door and, you know, and said, hi, I'm Bob Hudgens. I'm working on this movie called Groundhog Day for Columbia Pictures. And she's just like, what you're doing? No. And she's shaking her head and, and just giving us the, the kind of the stink eye. And, uh, and then Ron is like, no, I'm with the Illinois, I'm with the film office, you know, all this stuff. We're legit, uh, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and she goes, well, how did you know? I'm like, who put you up to this? We're like, we're like looking at each other at that point going, what do you mean? And uh, he, he, she goes, well, how did you know that I'm from Pugsatawney? <laughs> and, and I'm like, we didn't, ma'am. <laughs> Happy accident. Uh, so, uh, you know, sure enough, she was from right outside Punxsutawney, has gone to the Groundhog Day event many, many, many times in her life and knew all about it. And she had thought someone had put us up to gagging her <laughs> and, and showing up and going, you know, well, we're going to make a Groundhog Day movie and ha, ha, ha. And, and, but no, we were the real deal. And so it was really funny how that's how our relationship started. But it was, they were delightful people to work with. And they, a fam, they had five kids. And that's why they had that big house and all that stuff. So it, uh, it worked out really well. But uh, boy, was I nervous because I had to deliver the goods. And I was so happy to call Harold and go, we got the house. And he was like, well done. So yay, it's uh, a, a real nice situation. So. Why didn't they ever make a sequel? Well, I think Harold said it pretty quickly. How do you do a sequel to this? Uh, well, it was a tough movie to do. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Do. Yeah. 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 Do better than that. Just because Bob said the continuity of it all is the same day over. Yeah. That's, that's a really tough movie to do. Well, you know, Andy and Bill got together <laughs> for the next generation. <laughs> okay. I, I hate to say this, but this is going to have to be last question. I'm really sorry. So who really, really wants to ask a question? Yes, sir. You came from Ohio. I'm sorry. He gets the... Um, the question I had was about those seven trucks. <laughs> were those trucks from, did you guys buy them from people here in town? Or yes, they found them. There was a, our team sir camp was a guy named George DiLinardi. He picked them um, up in the area. Uh, we painted them. One was red and I think one was blue. And they turned, I think it was that orange color we had when we shot it. So we have to match. Even the Eldorados were spotless clean. We made them all rusty and nasty looking. <laughs> I almost cried when I saw what they were doing. Oh, like, what are you doing with these cars? You know? So we made it look kind of like a crappy old car, but they were pristine when we bought them. Yeah. Well, I, I'm really sorry we can't just kind of meander into the evening in, in this conversation. Uh, thank, you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. But I, I want to thank you guys, and I hope all of you keep coming to Woodstock. Uh, it's obviously an incredibly important place for me personally. I love this town, and uh, I have felt love from this town like, gosh, I, it's, it's remarkable. Come enjoy the spirit of Woodstock, and uh, you, know, you know, go see silly movies. They're really, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a good thing. Cheers.